Now, I mentioned earlier how renowned author, clinical psychologist and purveyor of rational thought and common sense, Jordan Peterson, has been talking about climate policy madness, including with reference to Australia. I caught up with him earlier today in Toronto and asked him why governments don't seem to be interested in doing cost versus benefit analysis when it comes to emissions reductions policies. I don't think they do any analysis at all. I mean, I, I've thought recently about guidelines, let's say moral guidelines for determining who should lead you in the face of a potential apocalypse. So let's say just for a moment that the climate alarmists are correct, even though they're not, especially not in their economic modeling. But here's a theory. Um, how do you tell a good leader in a time of crisis? Well, if someone is paralyzed into terror by the thought of the impending future, and they're willing to turn into the sort of tyrant who will use compulsion and force on others to get them to, uh, to uh, comply, then you have someone who's so afraid of that particular dragon that they've turned into a petrified tyrant. And those aren't the right people to be leading. And there have been careful analysis done by people like Marion Tupi and Bjorn Lomberg showing that we can chart a pathway forward through whatever climate trouble we're going to encounter and all the other environmental troubles that we do have to deal with without panicking, without using compulsion and force, without destroying the farmers and the energy community and without impoverishing poor people. And it's well, just a, a lack, an utter lack of forethought. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there, there are logical ways forward and logic seems to be cast aside. Uh, I noticed that you've noticed from afar what's going on in Australia, a similar economy to your own native Canada. We don't have the hydro resources you have, but we have a lot of energy resources, including uranium, yet we refuse yeah. to embrace nuclear. That, again, surely is shunning a rational path forward. It's pretty obvious the EU, if I remember correctly, in recent weeks has decided that both natural gas and nuclear are now green. And anyone with any sense who wasn't rabidly anti-capitalist out of their mind would have figured that out at least 20 years ago. You know, the Americans switched to fracking well, pretty much at the turn of the millennium. And they've cut their carbon output by 15%. And no environmentalist predicted that and nobody seems to be celebrating it. You know, we know you want to move the planet forward. You move people from dung and wood to coal and from coal to petroleum and from petroleum to a, some combination of nuclear and renewables. We know the pathway forward economically. And if you care for poor people, the only thing you really care about is making energy cheap. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's been the foundation of uh, modern prosperity. There are also geostrategic issues here and implications. And I want to share with you something that our former Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, said in London this week. He asked the question, actually, should cutting emissions remain the world's highest priority when it has the practical effect of making the democracies relatively weaker and the dictatorships relatively stronger. This is the reality, isn't it? Our climate policies hurt us, but they're helping China and Russia. Well, they're hurting us and they're not helping the planet. And they're, as you said, they're destabilizing the supply chains and the world order. I mean, this is, it's absolutely and utterly preposterous. And it's time for centrist liberals and conservatives to take the moral upper hand away from the environmental radicals. Tell me, as a psychologist, tell me about what's going on here when it comes to group behaviour. There's, uh, on, on one hand, it seems like a, a doomsday cult overtaking large parts of the world. On the other hand, there's this sort of virtue signalling sanctimony where people are pretending that they're saving the planet. Well, I don't think you also want to underestimate the degree to which venal and narcissistic political types who are cowards tend to govern purely by the whim of the, the public as sampled by half-wit opinion polls. I mean, we know in Canada, for example, that the COVID lockdowns and the travel bans were almost implemented entirely on the basis of opinion polls and then blamed on the science. And the same thing is exactly happening on the environmental front. People are rightly concerned about environmental sustainability and politicians who are in it for the narcissism and who are not very well informed are willing to pander to the worst fears of the of the populace, and that's not what a representative democracy is supposed to do. You know, we are able to innovate faster than we are 
consuming. So Marion Tupi in his new book, Superabundance, has calculated that every baby born now will produce seven times as many resources as they will consume. And you might think, well, that's preposterous. It's like, no, it's not. Since I was a kid, we've doubled the planet's population and everyone is way richer. And the globalist apocalyptic utopians say, well, that's not sustainable. It's like, so what are you gonna do? Are you gonna kill off 2 billion people because you think there's too many people on the planet? And you don't think that's reprehensible beyond comprehension? It is extraordinary, but we need liberal democracies to start waking up to this. Uh, there's no sign of that in Australia at the moment. There's no sign of that in the UK or in North America. The Dutch fam uh, farmers, are, are they a hint of, of what's to come? Well, they're a peaceful hint of what's to come. Sri Lanka is more of a hint of what's to come. Or Germany, where they're rationing energy. Or the UK, where they expect power bills to hit 5,000 pounds a year next year. That's like 15% of people's net income. This is not a good idea. And, you know, if it was possible that it would do anything positive on the environmental front, maybe you could make a case for it. But there's no bloody way that impoverishing a quarter of the world's population, which is exactly what high energy prices and high food prices are going to do, there's just no possible way forward to a sustainable garden under those conditions. As you say, Jordan Peterson, it is so obvious, but so many people are falling for this charade at the moment. It's great to talk to you. I look forward to catching up in person when you're in Australia in November. I'm very much looking forward to it, and hopefully we'll all be able to develop something approximating a more positive vision to help people see a way forward through, you know, to economic prosperity for the absolutely poor and to a sustainable planet. I think we can have our cake and eat it too. Great stuff. Thank you, Jordan. You bet. Good to talk to you, man. Jordan Peterson there, very passionate about a logical approach to any environmental and climate change issues.